Welcome to Question Mark, the podcast. Exploring the greatest story ever told with open minds and open hearts. We light it up, we won't come down. And the sun can't stop us now. Watching it come true, it's taking over you. This is the greatest show, where it's covered in all the colored lights. And the runaways are running the night. Impossible comes true, it's taking over you. This is the greatest show. Hello and welcome to Question Mark, a fortnightly podcast about the greatest story ever told, Mark's Gospel. Whether this is the first episode you've listened to or you're a regular listener, you are very welcome. My name's David Payne and I'll be your host for this, the 31st episode. We're nearly halfway through the journey through this extraordinary tale, which is surely as relevant to life in the 21st century as it was to first century believers. Well, today it's my great pleasure to introduce our special guest, Sean Blackman, who, for those watching on YouTube, uh, appears to be in space. But he describes himself as being a church minister, running business, and a former elected borough councillor. He has a unique achievement, which I'll let him explain in a minute. And Stefan Smart has recently been performing his one-man performance of Mark's Gospel in the West Country, and will be appearing at the Edinburgh Fringe in August. He had this great idea of inviting friends from many different backgrounds to meet up to chat about the life of Jesus as presented in Mark's Gospel, which I hope you're enjoying listening to as much as we're enjoying. We'll let the guests go first. So, Sean, uh, would you like to start by saying a bit about yourself, maybe what ex- explaining your connection with Steph, and what's your unique achievement? Yeah. Okay, so uh, well, I'm just turned 60 years old. I'm married to Cheryl for 37 years, got three children, five grandchildren, and um, I remember Steph when I was in Southampton is both a kind of friend neighbor and like yourself David just around the corner from where we are I was most impressed with Steph in terms of prayer becoming increasingly monastic and monk-like um, <laughs> week by week and and so it's been intriguing to see how he's kind of developed into this um, uh, from an introvert it seemed to me um, hermit type character to an extrovert performing on stage and around the world so it's been fascinating kind of watching that but also seeing him model this idea of, of not just memorizing scripture but actually uh, embedding it uh, in terms of a performance you know which is really reaching out and speaking to people in ways which I'm sure was intended in the first place I don't think it was ever intended necessarily to be locked up within a book I think it was mm-hmm. meant to be formed and I think that's uh Steph's I think is recapturing what was the essence of the first century um writer you know uh, Mark so yeah and so your you, unique achievement unique achievement yeah well I mean something which kind of I, I don't know anybody else has done this so um you have to say it's a unique achievement mm-hmm. a number of years ago I became a, a local local um a school governor and at the school I was at, I asked them what the big problem was as far as kids were concerned. And they said, reading. And I said, what do you mean? I said, well, people are so caught up with their electronic devices, such as their phones and their tablets and their laptops and their computers, that they're spending less and less time doing such things as reading, you see. So uh, I said, well, can't you encourage them to read? And they said, well, as teachers, uh, it doesn't really have much of an impact. In fact, I haven't read a book in X number of years. Yeah. Why is it my researcher discovered that most people don't read more than 10 books after the time they leave school? Wow. So anyway, so I said, well, perhaps if I model reading to kids and get them to read at the same time, maybe that's a way in which, you know, I could have an impact. So uh, at the school, I started off with reading 100 books in 100 days, which is 50 children's books and 50 kind of big books. And so the way I do it is uh, with the children's books, I managed to kind of read sort of uh, um, quite easily one a day. But I'd use those particularly if I was doing larger books. So on the 100 book a day, books a day, books, 100 books in 100 days uh, situation where I was linked to um, BBC Radio Solent, uh, two of the books were the Bible and uh, War and Peace. <laughs> so um and it's not possible to read either the bible or war and peace in a day it's just not possible so um but anyway so what i did was i read you know kind of books in, in between and um uh, you know managed to to uh, uh read the bible and in fact, the last book was the war and peace which took me 14 hours three it's actually three <laughs> books and uh radio Solent, i was which i was doing a stint on for uh the period of three months 
they asked me to read the last uh, what, the last paragraph of War and Peace on the actual programme itself, you see. <laughs> and they asked me that the day before, and I'd planned to kind of finish off War and Peace at the end of my last 100 days, you know, the first 100 days. And um, so <laughs> I realised I'd have to read it through the night to finish for about seven o'clock on this little programme, which is what I did, and I dressed up. Oh. like um leo tell story and then i was i'm there i kind of uh I, I realized i got addicted you know to this idea of reading a book a day and uh just carried on did 365 books in 365 days and carried on and uh i'd have to devote two to three hours a day every day waking up sort of four o'clock ish to get things done but raised thousands of pounds for local schools got books in and transformed lives had kids uh gave awards to kids at school yeah in fact in fact um the um uh, two schools are linked with 500 kids uh, on the last session of the last hundred books um, they were encouraged to read as many books as they could within that sort of period of time and um, uh, uh, it was, it, they read more than 6,000 books you know um, over that period of 14 weeks last 14 weeks in fact, several kids came up to me and said they'd read over 80 books in that period wow. of time and affected school performance and all those kind of yeah, things. Yeah. So, um, but um, I have I have kept up that momentum since. I kind of felt I'd done a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else's job now. Yeah, yeah I know. That's <laughs> it. I, I mean, I, I've done. I did. I think I did forty prayer books in forty days. I think that was oh. the last thing I did. You know, since then. But um, yeah. So that's my kind of achieve sort of achievement, and um, had to learn sort of reading techniques and uh, being dyslexic. You know, it's uh, you know hard work. So, mm. but uh, yeah. So we're in for a treat. You're kind of like a walking encyclopedia or walking yes, library. Yes, probably of useless information. So uh, <laughs> you know, lots, of, lots of stuff in there. And from time to time, it comes out in an intelligible way. <laughs> Very good. And apparently you can also be heard on Gospel Hospital Radio, I understand. Yeah, okay, I do a sort of weekly programme, sort of 10 o'clock on Sunday, Good News Sunday. So, um, yeah, beginning to sort of develop that and uh, have guests along and so on. So it's good. Right. A man who lives life to the full. Here's another That's man who lives life to the full, Stefan Smart. I imagine most of our listeners know Stefan Smart, who started this podcast. Steph, by the time of this, this broadcast, I think we'll be just about to fly up to Edinburgh. Yeah. Packing our bags. Would you like to say a, bit, a little bit more about where the Iron Mark journey is at the moment? Yeah, at the moment, uh, we're preparing for Edinburgh um, and we'll be there from the 5th to the 13th of August at the uh, Willow Studio, Riddles Court, Greenside Theatre, which is on the Royal Mile. Um, so easy to get to if you happen to be in the area. Um, but yes, until then, apart from preparing, I'll be in Cornwall. I've just been in Plymouth. So it's kind of a West Country tour at the moment. And one of the things I'm looking forward to in doing in Cornwall is to visit three of the sites which Wesley and the early Methodists used to preach in, open air sites actually. There were former miners pits and they became preaching pits. And so I'll be doing a bit like Sean really, doing three performances in three days in uh, these preaching pits in Cornwall in early July. So I'm really looking forward to that. Great, lots to look forward to. Right, well let's, just before we get started with today's discussion, the passage from Mark's gospel is gonna be read for us by our good friend, Lucy Warner. Mark chapter 8, verses 14 to 21, New International Version, the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, It is because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? When I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the four thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? Thank you, Lucy. Well, firstly, Sean, we'll let the guest go first, I think. Um, what are your initial thoughts when you look at this passage? I wonder what the main point is you'd like to start with. And then after we've looked at the details in the passage, I wonder whether we could, a bit later on, we could zoom out a bit and have a look at where we are in the story, the context of, of what we've been talking about. We'll just start with the, your first thoughts. 
Yeah, well, I, I, I almost kind of feel this is uh, a kind of a spec savers, like spec savers advert, really. <laughs> Um, <laughs> with, a, <laughs> with, with, with a promise of, of uh, Jesus improving our our spiritual eyesight, really. So um, uh, that's what it's basically about. But uh, I, I, I think we could be fooled into thinking that uh, he's just simply condemning people for not understanding something where it's actually part of a process. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when we are enlightened, we kind of we do we do start at a place of, of uh, ignorance or doubt, you know, we have to start with doubt before we go to faith. We have to start with ignorance before we come to understanding. So it's part of a, a, a process. And uh, and I think one of the key things about um, becoming someone who is enlightened is you recognize that you need some help. Mm -hmm. You haven't got it all. So yeah. I think it's an encouragement for us not to think that just because we're Christians, we can understand everything. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly does seem to a casual reader, if you like, that Jesus is just getting exasperated with the disciples and thinking, what am I going to do with you guys? Like a teacher trying to teach fractions to someone who doesn't want to learn it. Steph, what do you make of it? Yeah, I think that I, I love this idea of process. I think it's right. And I think about process, too, in terms of the process of the story, you know, having to learn the whole thing has made me more and more conscious of the fact the whole thing works together as one unit. And you have echoes of things going you know, backwards and forwards as you go along. And this is this story is no exception. In fact, I think some scholars think this this story is a bit of a linchpin, actually. I think for me, the main thing about it is this this issue of understanding, as, as Sean says, but also in terms of how, you know, each one of us and anyone who's listening might approach this passage, because the thing about this passage is there are some bits in it which are really mysterious. And I know I am guilty of this, that when one comes across something like this, especially if one's reading a story, if we don't understand something quite. We might make something up to kind of convince ourselves we understand it and then move on because we're eager to get on with the story we don't want to be held up with kind of trying to work it and tease it out um and i think this one in particular you know there are all sorts of questions like you know why why is jesus exasperated actually what is it about them that he's really exasperated about and what is this stuff about yeast and, and so on, yeast of the Pharisees? And why is bread suddenly so important in the whole thing? So, you know, there's all these all these things which are, are really quite weird, actually, in this in this story. So I think I'm looking forward to trying, you know, together, maybe coming to a better understanding of what that is all about. OK, uh, one of our listeners has who, who often has some quite good insights, has just got questions. She sounds quite exasperated. The disciples' <laughs> response to Jesus' warning bears no relation to what Jesus had said. How can not having any bread have anything to do with Herod and the Pharisees? It's like they weren't even listening to what Jesus said. I can understand him saying they have ears but aren't making good use of them. Why are the disciples unable to hear what Jesus is saying? Do you want to start that, Steph? <laughs> yeah, well, that's, I think, I mean, to be absolutely... I'm trying to be generous to our listener who came, came up with that question. And I would, you know, a year or so, maybe even less, I would have agreed. This, that's the sort of thing that goes through your mind. What, what's the connection between all of these things? So have the disciples simply ignored what Jesus is talking about? Or are mm. they talking about the same subject? And now I'm believing, beginning to believe it is actually the same subject. Um, when Jesus talks about the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of the Herodians, um, it has a lot to do with bread. It has an absolute huge amount to do with bread. And it brings us back to the question, I think, as to why Jesus would mention the yeast of the Pharisees and the, and the Herodians in the first place. And the, the reason he does it is because they only bring one loaf. Now, I could, I could... I could try and explain that right away, but what I, want to, what I don't want to do is just talk for at great length at this point where we're, we're supposed to have a, be having a conversation. But for me, for me, this kind of illustrates the point I made earlier that the story all fits together. It does actually fit together. It doesn't seem to, but it really does. And not only that, it's part of a process through the story as a whole. This isn't the first time these these matters which we're going to discuss have come up in the story so yeah great that's a great taster about it's all about bread uh sean what do you think about that 
Yes. Well, I, I just think there's a there's a tendency that we all have is, is to read into the story uh, what we'd like to see in the story. Mm. And uh, as opposed to allow the story to, to, to impact us and you know, it, it's when you when you assume things, you make an ass of you and me. You know, you actually assume yeah. things. <laughs> and and I, and I think, um, yeah, I, I think it hits me at a number of different levels. I think first of all, if I just think from the perspective of Jesus being exasperated with his disciples, um, that's I haven't heard that spoken on many occasions. You know, mm. on a Sunday sermon, it tends to be Jesus, God, Jesus loves you. This I know because the Bible tells me so. Mm. But this idea of Jesus being exasperated with us. You know, I, I think there's something there's something about that that we need to grab hold of. That it's a relational thing. You know, if we yeah. think of people we're close to, whether it's uh, our spouses or our children, you know, it's not all kind of hunky dory. You know, so it's not all kind of lovey dovey. You know, there are times when we have we have disagreements. We don't see things eye to eye, and yet sometimes the way we talk about our relationship with God is if it's all kind of all lovey dovey and everything's fantastic, and Jesus loves me. This th I know because the Bible tells me so as opposed to this whole thing that we can grieve the Holy Spirit, yeah. you know, that we, we can upset God, we can hurt him, you know, we can offend yeah. him. And, and he's not always pleased with us, you know? So, I, and I think this, this, this aspect of God's character of, of, of someone who relates to us on a personal basis and shows the same kind of emotions we'd expect in any kind of relationship, I think it's something that we need to kind of grab hold of. So, um, yeah, so I think one of the great things, I mean, I was just, I've got, I've got this um, series that my children bought me for my, my birthday, which is um, um, uh, uh, from a Jewish perspective, which looks at the, the whole thing of the, uh, uh, um, the Torah, you know, the books of Genesis. And, and uh, the, the actual author says that um, uh, um, God often, often communicates his message to us through story. You know, it's actually yeah. through story that he actually makes truth known. Yes, you know, so it's yeah. truth known story. And the great thing about story and metaphor is it hits you in so many different levels. And I think it's very easy just to get caught up with a particular yeah. word. What does he mean by yeast? You know, what does he mean <laughs> by Herodias? What does he mean by, and, and, and you kind of miss, well, hold on a second, Jesus is exasperated. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. kind of like sometimes, you know, I remember when my children were younger and if I kind of raised my voice slightly and I'd say, have you got the message? Yes, you're angry, Dad. Yeah, and that, that wasn't the message. <laughs> I'd raise my voice, you know. But what they picked up is that I'm angry, you know. Yeah, and and I think um, so. I, I think sometimes we can get caught up with the the wrong thing, you know, in terms of yeah. you know what God's trying to communicate. Actually, I've upset God here. Do you know what I mean? Maybe there's something I'm missing here. I mean, I would, I would, I would agree with that <laughs> characterization of the the fact that we are in a relationship with God, and God isn't as kind of lovey-dovey kind of figure he has actually he's a real person with real emotions and I think Sean's absolutely right and I mean it, it's incredible this this bit isn't it his exasperation and I've counted in the original Greek it's got it's 10 questions one after another it's like um it's like a machine gun and my director when she when she said to me you know I will, I'd like you to perform Jesus in a certain way. I sort of, I said to her, you know, what do I do when Jesus gets exasperated? And she says, well, as you can, you can, you know, obviously you can't, you can get annoyed, um, but you mustn't give up this idea of having unconditional love for the people who are listening to you. And I think that's true. But even so, in this case, I mean, it's like, don't you get it? Don't you understand? Didn't you see, et cetera. It's that kind of vehemence that comes across and i think you, sean you're absolutely right you know we can we can kind of under underestimate god <laughs> at our peril if we think he's he's not got um aspects to his personality where he can be hurt and he can be um upset and he can be exasperated as well i agree but i would i would take issue with you slightly about being caught up with every word because i think my my point earlier was the the problem the problem with reading some of this story is that unless we understand every word, we mm. miss it. Mm. We miss the point. Mm. Um, Mark, I, I'm, I'm more or less, I'm more and more convinced that Mark chose his words really carefully. A lot of people think yeah. he kind of put it all down slapdash, but no, yeah. I think he chose them carefully. And unless we are conscious, hold on, why that word? And we know what other words might yeah. mean as well okay. yeah i think we've got to be so, careful. So, so, yeah so maybe maybe we need to kind of expand that slightly i think what i mean basically is this is i think some words are more important than others yeah yeah 
you know sure. not, not, uh, and and so like with the bible you know um uh, we have a canon within a canon there are yeah. certain books of, of the bible you know there are certain verses in the bible which we have we give more emphasis you know sure. to sure. god so loved the world you know who would John three sixteen etc. You know, so there is that kind of sense. So I, I think it's more a case of actually, you know, uh, recognizing that the, all, all those words are important, yeah. but there are some words which are more important than others. So, for example, bread is a symbol of God's provision. You know, we think of give us this day our daily bread. We think of bread and and of course communion. You know, we think of mm. the physical side and the spiritual side. And and when one of the questions that was asked was in terms of the um, uh, the bread left over you know that's that's the e expression of god's extravagance it's not yeah. an ex expression of god's waste you could say hold a second the stuff left over which could be thrown in the bin no the point is it's about god's yeah. extravagance yeah. Yeah. it's not like god do you know what i mean what yeah. a waste yeah you know why yeah. did god have to produce stuff it's yeah. not going to be even used to be thrown that's away right. no that's a picture of god's extravagance you know so i think it's the whole thing of, of uh, i mean all, as i said all the words are important but it's actually seeing how they sort of fit you know fit together and as you know within the original greek it's very different to english which is very english is very linear one two three mm. four five yeah. where greek you can almost throw the words up up in the air <laughs> and <laughs> it doesn't matter which way they kind of come down to a certain extent yeah is, is they're still able to actually you know you bring together you know ideas where english is a lot more of a linear yeah you know really you good. know one two three four five so it's it's um and uh, i mean it's interesting that jesus used the word uh, testing as in temptation you don't tempt mm. similar kind of you know words here you know um mm. so um yes yeah, yeah so as so i agree with so i agree I, I agree with you with that particular you know focus on on the whole thing of of uh, words every word is yeah. important yeah i think what i'd say is that actually to get the meaning of something is what are the key key things yeah. which, hold, which hold it together yeah and i think what you've isolated are you know why what's the most important feature of this passage from mm -hmm. our point of view you know one of those things that you as you said earlier is is god's character another one is god's generosity so i wouldn't i wouldn't disagree i think that's absolutely right it's really important to read the bible in that way mm -hmm. So in terms of this exasperation that we've talked about, um, mm. what, what is it that Jesus is actually wanting from the disciples? What does he expect them to do or understand? And maybe also, therefore, if we're only seeing the exasperation, what is it we're meant to understand from this, do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Do you, What's that first, all about? Do you want to go first, Sean? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think um, maybe it's, maybe it's a sign of my uh, age or growing maturity. Um, I think what I'm very conscious of is that uh, what I bring to the passage sometimes takes takes it away, takes things away which aren't necessarily there. You know, that I that I kind of say, well, this is what you're saying. And hold a second. No, you haven't heard me. <laughs> okay lord i need to really you know next yeah. year is, is a very good way of, of just ensuring that we're really kind of hearing for god and i think sometimes we just sort of jump to jump to a conclusion so i think there's a sense of jesus not feeling hurt here mm. and and um uh um when he talks about this whole thing do you have ears ears to hear you know of course he's not just talking about physical ears he's talking about spiritual ears he's just saying if you're really hearing where i'm sort of cu coming from mm. uh, and um uh, you know, within the the, the Jewish um, uh, uh, discipleship system for, for rabbis, you know, it's through asking questions. You know, now Jesus is the one asking questions here. It's supposed to be the disciples. The idea of someone who 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 becomes who goes from the process of being an apprentice rabbi to being a proper rabbi is asking questions. Yeah. Keep asking questions until they run out of questions, and then they come to a place where now people are asking them questions because they've got answers. But what's interesting is they're not asking him questions. It's Jesus modeling asking questions. But yeah. they should be asking him questions because the reason you ask questions is so you understand. But, th but they're not really asking questions. They've, they've assumed, like an ass of you and me, you know. So <laughs> they, they're they not asking him questions. Okay, expand things to you. I, I, so I don't think I have a problem with that. If they'd said to him, really don't get it. You know, you look at Mark 4, you know, and in terms of Matthew sort of 13, it's a great you know, example of Jesus sort of taking the disciples aside and, ex and explaining the passage, you know, you know, to them and unpacking things. 
and um, it's clear because they don't get it first time. But he takes the weight on, and, and almost this, this is this is thing here, is where it's it's kind of you're not going to get it straight away. You need to ask me some questions. You know, you won't get it. You need to ask some questions. Yeah. <laughs> ask me some questions. Don't don't tie me up. What, what I'm saying, ask me some more questions until you've asked all your questions, and then when you've asked all the questions, you can tell me what you think. But don't start start off by assuming you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, fascinating, Steph. Would you concur with that? I, I think I would. Yeah, I, and I, I think I would. I but I, I guess I'm thinking about other things as well. I'm thinking, um, again, this kind of imponderable point. My question, I guess, is why say certain things at certain times? And I'm not satisfied simply to think, oh, okay, this may be because... And, 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 I, and then I begin to speculate, just as Sean's saying, you know, the. The temptation in this story is to speculate, oh, this must have been going on, etc. And I think I'm not sure that is actually the case. So I think just looking at one of the questions, I mean, the two main questions are why mention the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod in the first place when it had nothing whatsoever to do with anything else, yeah. apart perhaps from the fact that Jesus had just met the, the Pharisees on the, the shores of Dalmanuthia. But having said that, there's nothing really connecting that with anything else. And the other thing is, what is it Jesus is actually exasperated on about? And I guess it's my contention that they are all connected, including the bit about the bread, as I said earlier. And I, I think it all depends, again, on your kind of awareness of where the Greek is, as Sean's put, you know, put it forward, put forward already so well. I mean, the Greek is a little bit more um, colourful and flexible as a language than, than the English. So when you get a a translation like the NIV, which is the one Lucy's read out from just now, you think, oh yeah, well, I understand it. I've nailed it, I've nailed it. But actually mm -hmm. the words have more vibrancy and life than mm -hmm. uh, you initially think. So the disciples had forgotten to bring bread, just the very first words of that passage. Well, the word forgotten is also actually the word neglected. So it's not clear whether they forgot because they were kind of absent-minded or whether they neglected it and, and more actively. And uh, it's, it's certainly my suspicion that it's more likely to be the latter. Um, they only bring with them one loaf. So they didn't actually neglect to bring bread per se. They just brought one loaf. Mm -hmm. So the question is, why did they neglect to bring anything more than one loaf? And then mm -hmm. if you think back to where they have just been, they've just been involved in the feeding of the 4,000. Before that, it was a feeding of the 5,000. There's yeah. bread involved in that as well. There's something going on with bread. And then you get to the point where um, you have to understand the geography of it. And I think the geography is the key here, perhaps, as to why they only bought one loaf, why they neglected to bring any other loaves. And, and I know you might feel at this point, hey, hold on, Steph, you're only talking about one verse. Um, it's only a minor thing, but actually it could be the key to unlocking the whole thing, mm. um, because they're actually going to Bethsaida. The next part of the story is they land in Bethsaida. And Bethsaida is a Gentile area, mm. Gentile territory. Mm. The disciples, it, it, I, it's not my view, to be honest, but I'm beginning to think it might be credible. The disciples are not very happy about this stuff with Gentiles. They don't like the last no. time Jesus told them to go to Bethsaida. He had to force them to get into the boat. That was just after the feeding of the 5,000. It says mm. he compelled them to get into the boat and go to Bethsaida ahead of him. So they don't really like the idea of going to Bethsaida and they don't like the idea of getting bread and giving it to people who they don't necessarily approve of. If a Jew sits down with a Gentile, that's kind of anathema. You don't do that. That's, a, that's inappropriate, completely wrong religiously. That was against their law. They don't believe in it. But Jesus, of course, has a different view as to what, where God's mercy is directed. Is it directed just at Israel? No, it's Israel and mm. the nations. Anyway, the point of the story is they only bring one loaf, enough for themselves, not for anyone else. They don't want to share it with anyone else. They don't want to eat mm. with anyone else at all. And Jesus mm. says to them, and this is the point, and I'll stop in a minute, I promise. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. So, okay, First of all, yeast. 
yeast is a good thing, isn't it? But actually in Jewish culture, that the word there would have been leaven, which would be a bad thing. If you have too much leaven in your loaf, you're going to poison the batch. Mm. So watch out for the poison of the Pharisees and the poison of Herod. So both groups, the Herodians and the Pharisees, have some poison you've got to be watching out for. When, when, when the NRV talks about watch out for, it's almost like it's saying to the disciples, hold on, just be careful you don't fall into the same trap. Actually, Jesus is in the, in the Greek, Jesus is saying, take heed, you're about to do this. You are doing this. You are on the verge of doing this. It's much more mm. urgent. It's much more insistent. Beware, he's saying. Mm. And the yeast of the Pharisees is, well, the one thing they don't like and it's come up time and time again, is anyone eating with anyone else who's unclean? Anyone eating, anyone having fellowship with anyone else who's not of the right persuasion? In other words, the Pharisees are exclusivists. And then he says, watch out for the yeast of the Herodians. The Herodians are into what Herod was into, power, political power. And in this story, I'm afraid to say, both things apply to the disciples so far in the story and will do again and again the exclusivity they don't like sharing with anyone except their own the right the righteous ones themselves and they love the idea of being greater than other people you know having positions of power so you get mm -hmm. james and john coming to jesus later on saying Help us, you know, let us be sitting on the right and the left in your kingdom and your glory. And everyone's arguing about who is the greatest, who is the greatest. Mm. Jesus is saying this is not, this is the stuff that belongs to the Herodians. It belongs to the Pharisees. Get rid of it. It's wrong. And the, mm. I think the key, the key point here is how much is the church today similarly having these problems? The exclusivity where we say mm. it's an us and them situation. We're right, you know, even if it's in terms of denominations, we're right, the others are wrong. Mm -hmm. Or we Christians have got it all, and those who are on the outside, Jesus doesn't love them, etc. Whatever the view might be, the exclusivity of everything, and this power thing where people attempt to be mm -hmm. in the church, mm -hmm. have power over other people. That's the thing. You get you you get one up on other people. Jesus' kingdom is nothing to do with that, it's to do with service. Mm. so that's just one of the questions yeah 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 what do you think about that sean does that yeah does yeah no I, I agree i mean um the, the, the northwest of, of the country so which is sort of gen effectively gentile country this is where you've got the um uh, mi mixed race jewish people you know which they would have definitely looked down upon yeah. even though they're up there in the north you know uh so i think it's, it, this is god including gentiles in his provision so, and as Steph was saying, I totally agree with that, that um, they would have felt very uncomfortable to sort of be moving farther and farther up north, you know, where um, uh, there has been a, uh, a comp compromise and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, if you think of the, the, the woman of the, of the well, you know, she, she would have been like many Samaritans who just accepted the book, the, the books of the law, but not accepted, you know, the prophets, yeah. you know, and, and, and the books of Psalms. So, so they had a kind of a, that looked down upon them because they didn't accept the whole Bible as the word of God, you see. Mm -hmm. And and it just, it, it's home to me. It reminds me of a story that, um, you know, in terms of this whole thing of being, be wearing of both that religious influence side and that, that sort of uh, political influence, you know, being aware yes. of those two things. Yeah. And I, th and I think for me, from both sides, I've, I've seen that both the, the institutional side where, you know, I've come across people who've almost said that the institution is more important than truth, <laughs> you know, whether it's wow. church, yeah. Or whether, it's a, whether it's a political party, you know, and I've yeah. challenged at both levels and saying, well, actually, truth is more important, wow. you know, than any church, you know, than, than any political party, you know. So for me, on a sort of personal basis, I've, I've really had challenges in terms of, from a political point of view, with the behaviour of my leader within, the, you know, the Conservative Party, really struggled, you know, with that and challenged and said, integrity is really important, you know, but it's gone against the grain mm. because that often people have looked at it from a political perspective and say, yeah, but he's a winner. So, yeah, but character is more important, you know. <laughs> anyway, so 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 I think very often, you know, we get caught up with the externals and miss out yeah. some of the key, some of the, some of the key issues. But it reminds me of a lady when I was at uh, Bible College at Spurgeon's, and she was talking about the whole thing of women being in a ministry, 
And she said, you know, it took a long time for women to be accepted within ministry because there was this perspective that spiritual ministry was for men, you see. So she tells this story, which I thought was quite amusing, of just kind of how often, you know, women are treated. She said there's a woman who um, um, wanted to be part of a local fraternal. No, it's a fraternal, you know, men sort of thing. And uh, she was a female minister and discovered the kind of thing they often did together, which was go fishing, you see. So she bought herself a rod and tack and all these kind of things, you see. And um, so um, and they all got into the boat and the boat kind of sailed from, you know, from the shore. And then she realised after a, a, a minute or so that, that she'd left her rod and her tackle, you know, on the, on the shore, you see. So she got out of the boat, walked across the water, picked up the rod and the tackle, you know, <laughs> and then got back onto water, walked across the water, back into the boat. Yeah. And then the guys looked at one another and said, typical woman, left a rod and tackle on the side. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And she said there's this kind of sort of sense where they just just couldn't accept that God could use a woman yes. within the context of ministry. That was the kind of the key yeah. issue, just yeah. missed on the fact, you know. Yeah. So um exactly. And I think and I think there's almost this kind of perspective where like look at this whole idea of the Gentiles being included in God's provision, you know, how can he use them? You know, how could he use the Roman Catholics? You know, how could God use the Anglicans? How could God use the, the new churches, you know? And this kind of, this one-upmanship, which happens from time to time, you know, we are the church or, yeah. you know, and so on. Uh, yeah, so, sure. we... earlier, getting a bit political in places there and uh, <laughs> moving on. Before the, the broadcast, yeah. you, or a little, a little bit earlier on, you said the main message from this passage, which is kind of, uh, spoiler alert coming up coming here that late that, that jesus can heal spiritual blindness and deafness um and he's better than spec savers tell us about that but that's obviously you obviously um run your life on on christian principles as a christian what does that mean for you what happens next how does he actually do that yeah well i mean i mean for me uh you know if i give a good example um for me just getting involved in, in politics in the first place mm. I, I i you know a lot of people said to me why why on earth do you get involved in politics and, and my story was that i was at a, a christian conference and someone had a particular word of knowledge and said there's someone here that god's calling into politics you see mm. and that when they shared that my heart was going boom 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 my head was saying oh god please choose somebody else <laughs> yeah <laughs> So I was hoping that, that you know, uh, that there'd be a crew, queue of people responding, you know, and I'd be back at the queue and it wasn't me, you know? Anyway, so I kind of responded, it was just me. And he said, <laughs> God is calling you into politics, you see. And I was just thinking, but I'm not involved in a political party. You know, I don't know where I, I don't know which party I would support and all these kind of things. He said, you know, God is called. I told Cheryl and Cheryl said, worth exploring, you know. And of course, when you look at scripture, you see people like Daniel and, and Joseph and Nehemiah and, and so many people, you know, you think of the kings of Israel, you know, there is this sense of, of um, you know, we need to be involved in our in our world. If we'd be salt and light, we, we've got to be able to come in contact. And, and for me, at times I really struggle being a Christian because I see things that I'm not you know, happy with, mm. but I realize if I'm not involved, I can't influence you know, I can't challenge, you know, and I, I can't, I can't make it, make it, make a difference. And I think there is, there is this thing, I think sometimes that within, you know, the, the Christian life where we're not as actively involved, you know, within our world as we could, as we could be. And, and I, and, and part of it is because we don't want to be infected. <laughs> but the other side though, is we can't bring healing. When I was in um, Edinburgh, I don't know whether you come across the plague doctor, you know, this, this horrible picture of this guy who was a sort, of, sort of quite sort of beak, but he kind of went around during the time of the plague and, and was trying to trying to give medication. But it's a horrific looking sort of figure in many respects. But but it's a very brave figure because what he's trying to do is to bring medication to people who really needed it. You know, he could be infected in the process. He could die in the process. But actually, he was coming to give life. And I think there is this thing, I think, within church when we become Christians um we we separate ourselves uh uh not not just from a holiness point of view but also from a, a kind of relational sort of point of view mm. and i remember talking to one of my regional ministers once and he said to me sean i know very few ministers who have non-christian friends you know most ministers i know just have christian friends and, I, and he says i know that's not a good thing 
Mm. But he said it just tends to happen over a period of time. They get, they get less and less involved in the world mm. and less able to actually influence. So I think um, this whole thing of getting in, getting involved, and Jesus clearly got involved, you know. So uh, I think getting involved in our world is very important. Indeed, indeed. Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, there's been all sorts of issues raised, all sorts of questions. I'm sure between you, you've sold some answers for listeners and um, and raised more questions as well. I, have I, to I wonder if it's one thing yeah do i, I was going to say I, I think we i would say we are missing a little bit which is very very important about what jesus is getting exasperated about right and i think we do really need to look at that and why is it that jesus focuses on the numbers of uh, leftovers yes so you could read this and i've read this as jesus is getting exasperated about the fact that they haven't understood that god can provide them with bread and they've argued about where we're going to get any bread. And Jesus is saying to them, don't you remember that, you know, we just had a miracle. In fact, we had two feedings of 5,000. Don't you remember that? But actually, seriously, really, the are they really that forgetful? Are they really? That does, just does not make, no, it's, it's, not, it's not the issue of whether the miracle took place. It's what actually happened during the miracle that Jesus is talking about. The main questions are, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? And in each case, it was either going to be 12 or it's going to be seven. That's what he's trying to get them to say the answer to. And he's saying, don't, when you say that answer, doesn't the penny drop? That's the question. That's okay. the question. So unless we understand that that's the main question, it's not about, don't you remember I did miracles? We're never going to understand this passage. And the point of the, the story here is, is, is fascinating, as we were saying earlier, that Jesus's ministry was not just to the, is, is the children of Israel. It was to the Gentiles. God's love is not just to Israel. It's to the nations through Jesus. Mm -hmm. So that's why Jesus performed two miracles, the feeding of the 5,000 in Israel territory, the feeding of the 4,000 in a, in a place where you'd have mixed Gentiles and Jewish people. Yeah. Mm. Now, the reason why he talks about the basketfuls, and this is what the disciples don't get, because they don't want to get their heads around the fact that Jesus loves everybody. Jesus loves everybody. Mm -hmm. They don't want to get their heads around that. But he's mm -hmm. trying to say to them, OK, so we're in Israel territory. How many basketfuls did you did they pick up? How, and, and how many was that? Twelve, they say. And for us, we have to understand why is Jesus focusing on the number of basketfuls? Well, 12, mm -hmm. of course, is the children of Israel. He's saying these numbers represent something. Duh. Mm -hmm. 12. Mm -hmm. You understand mm -hmm. that was God feeding Israel, just like he did in mm -hmm. the desert, feeding Israel with manna. And what about the 4,000? How many basketfuls were picked up there? Seven. Oh, okay. Seven being the number associated with the uh, Gentiles. Seven is the name. There's 70 nations in, 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 in biblical arithmetic. T the tens, you know, the powers of ten don't actually matter as long as it's a multiple of seven. Mm -hmm. Seven is the Gentile nations. And mm -hmm. Jesus used two words for basketfuls here. The first time he talks about how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? He mm -hmm. uses the word, the Jewish word for basketfuls, which is kofeni, yeah. large baskets. And the second time, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? He uses the Gentile word for basket, which is spirit mm. which is a smaller basket. He's making the point clear. Guys, guys, it's about both. It's not about just you, not just Israel. Get your head mm. around it. Don't you understand? Why, why is this important? Because I think we, too, are susceptible to want to we know God and we want to hold him in. And he's our own. We, it's, he belongs to our tribe. It's no one else to really be involved. And that even mm. our attitudes to those who are outside the church, we may mm. feel, oh, they don't belong. We're superior. Mm. We know God. Actually, that's, a, that's the yeast of the Pharisees. And mm. the yeast of the Herodians is, yeah, one denomination mm. is above another. Or within a church, 
the way to get on in church is to be number one, is to be the best speaker, is to be the most attractive, is to get people coming to see you. The more numbers I get to see me, the more, more successful I am. That's, a, a net, again, the yeast of the Herodians. So we, all of us, have to be very wary of them. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. I, I suppose um, I, I, I get something slightly different, actually, uh, from that. Uh, I... I uh, I think for me, what amazes me in terms of Jesus' exasperation, it is the exasperation of a of a parent. You know, yeah. how many t- how many times do I have to tell you? <laughs> you know, how yeah. many times have I done it? You know, you just aren't getting it. And, and I can just think of it when my children were younger. And and I, for me, I think what really hits me is the fact that Jesus doesn't abandon them. You know, yeah. He's still working with them. That he's, he's still at work in us even when we fail. Yes. You know what I mean? And yeah, I kind I of. I kind of find myself in a position where I'm sort of thinking to myself, Do you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have got it either. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I would, I would have, I would have said, okay, uh, okay. So I, I should have bought another. Yeah, I know, I know. We should have learned. Bring more. There's can be loads of loads of people coming. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> we should have bought some more food. You know, what one life is not. I, sh- I should have thought. That. Sorry, Jesus. I really. I should have thought. I'm so yeah. stupid. I'm really sorry. Yeah. What do you mean? I got no idea. <laughs> yeah. You got no idea what I'm talking about. I mean, yeah. I, I know. Yeah. I, I know what you're saying. No. no you, what do you mean? You, <laughs> I don't know what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. So why are you saying? You know, I I, I wouldn't have got it either. Yeah. I, th- I, yeah. I think I would have got it either. And it, it would have been kind of, going, what on earth was he talking about? Yeah. What on earth is he talking about? You know. I think you're right, Sean. I think you're right. And I think that's why the do you still not understand is directed to us as much as it is to the disciples. We get to hear at the beginning of the story, this is Jesus Christ, the son of God. The disciples don't get that until later on, much, much yeah. later on. But even when we know that, we don't understand yeah. who Jesus is, really. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Well, I think it's probably time to wrap up this conversation for now, at least. Um, Sean and Stefan, it's been a real pleasure, and hopefully, we'll have raised more questions. I think it probably has, as well as giving some insights <laughs> for our listeners. Thank you so much for joining me today, and it's fine to disagree on occasions, isn't it? Please join us again, or listen to previous episodes. No, I, I agree with you. I agree with you, Dave. I agree with Please you. join us again or listen to <laughs> previous <laughs> episodes on YouTube, Spotify and Apple Mule platforms. The more of you who like and subscribe, the more people will get to hear about us. If you'd like to share your thoughts and submit questions for future episodes, it's easy to join the I Am Mark community group on Facebook. If you're not already part of the group, just find us on Facebook and join in the conversation. However, the go-to place is the I Am Mark Facebook page where you can find links to watch previous episodes of Question Mark, find out about upcoming performances and book Steph to come and do a performance for you. That's all we have time for now. So it's goodbye from Sean Blackman. Bye. Reverend Sean Blackman. <laughs> goodbye from Stefan Smart. Bye. And until next time, goodbye from me. Goodbye. If you enjoyed this episode of Question Mark and don't want to miss any future episodes, be sure to click on the subscribe button. This also means other people can find the podcast and join the conversation too. We'd also love if you could leave a review so we know what was good and what we can improve for future episodes. If you want to find out more about I Am Mark, Stefan Smart's solo word-for-word dramatisation of Mark's Gospel, go to www.sleek.bio slash IamMark, where you can sign up for free for his newsletter and a whole host of other goodies. Join us and our special guests next time, where we'll continue to explore the greatest story ever told together. If you want to get involved with the podcast or have any questions or comments in the meantime, please do get in touch using the I Am Mark social media channels. We'd love to hear from you. We light it up, we won't come down. And the sun can't stop us now. Watching it come true, it's taking over you. And this is the greatest show, where it's covered in all the colored lights. And the runaways are running the night. Impossible comes true, it's taking over you. And this is the greatest show.